Oh hi, I'm the heretic. The opioid crisis. Millions of Americans are addicted to opiate-derived drugs, which is killing tens of thousands. Opioids being defined as drugs such as, well, opium, heroin, phenantel, oxycontin, and morphine, among others. The Center for Disease Control reported that drug overdoses accounted for 63,632 dead Americans, two-thirds of which involved an opioid. That's 173 people dead every single day from all overdoses. Between 1999 and 2015, it's estimated that overdoses killed 560,000. Since 1999, opioid overdoses have quadrupled, as have the prescriptions for opioids. In 2015, 27 million people self-reported the use of illegal drugs or abuse of prescriptions. Let's be clear though, this isn't 27 million addicts. The actual number of addicts that is to say, people diagnosed with substance use disorder is estimated to be around 2 million. The source for all these will be below, but the numbers are clear. The opioid crisis is hurting people. It's hurting a lot of people. To dismiss it as something that happens in other communities is to miss the point completely. It's not just the addicts who are no doubt wrecking their own lives in their relationships but the brothers, the sisters, the parents, aunts, uncles, all the relatives of the addicts who have to watch someone they love fade away against the sandpaper of their own horrible choices. But in order to solve this problem, we need to figure out its root causes. Several theories have been presented. Let's briefly go over them. 1. Aggressive marketing. According to this theory, Pharmaceuticals would target doctors and convince them, even through bribery, to prescribe pharmaceuticals more often than they normally would. With roughly 58,000 patients being prescribed opioids at 2.5 times the recommended dosage and patients being encouraged to doctor shop, where they look around for doctors to prescribe them opioids, often from multiple doctors or pharmacies, Similarly, pushes such as pain as the fifth vital sign got these drugs into hospitals and encouraged doctors to give them. The rationale is that pharmaceuticals got doctors to give people pain pills they didn't actually need and overstated the extent to which people suffer from pain ailments. The President's Commission Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis, which is a bit of a mouthful, claimed a single pharmaceutical company sponsored 20,000 events for doctors on spreading awareness of pain management through opioids. 2. Lack of education. This one's pretty simple. Patients are unaware of the risks of addiction associated with opioid medication, the risk of overdose, or the volatile combination of opioids with other substances, especially alcohol. If patients simply understood the risks they would push back against doctors when they were prescribed opioids. 3. Black markets. The trade of opioids in secondhand markets obtained legitimately but sold for profit or obtained illicitly through rogue manufacturers enables the supply to persist. Because these rogue manufacturers have no oversight, there is no quality control, so people overdose by pure accident from taking, for example, a dosage of pure phenantil by complete accident. Phenantil being a synthetic opioid far stronger than morphine by anywhere from 50 to 1,000 times potency. Speaking of phenantil, number four, China. China, 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 you take China. China. No, really. A congressional report released January 2018 blamed China for the ease in which Chinese manufacturers of phenantil can ship their goods to the United States, taking advantage of e-commerce and shipping infrastructure, such as the U.S. Postal Service, in distributing their goods. Basically, blaming China for how easily China can export things. Number five, lack of government oversight. The FDA is presented as the last line of defense between pharmaceutical industries and consumers who might otherwise take over-the-counter or prescription medicine 
under the assumption that it has to be safe. After all, it's on the shelf, isn't it? It's not the consumer's fault. They have their own lives to live. They can't be bothered to do the research into drugs, nor would they have the expertise. Drug companies also can make honest mistakes, not doing rigorous enough testing. Thus, federal and state agencies like the FDA are needed to reaffirm and strengthen their commitment to protect consumers from the honest mistakes that can ruin their lives. Lack of government intervention. Too much trafficking is being allowed passage through the postal system and on our streets, and there's not enough scrutiny both on doctors and on patients to make sure they are being kept safe. Not for lack of effort on the state's part, mind you, but from a lack of information. According to this point, more effort is needed in regards to keeping track of patients at the state and federal level to protect patients. Number 7. Government Intervention Specifically, among other things, how Medicare Part D, a new government entitlement program created in 2006 under the Bush administration, in its first year, it more than doubled its projected number of enrollees and as of 2017, 4.9 million Part D beneficiaries have received opioid prescriptions paid for under this program, exacerbated even further by the expansion of Medicaid under Obamacare. Number 8. Despair One only need to see maps in the U.S. of the rates of opioid overdoses with the rates of suicide. It affects the same regions of the country, places that are economically destitute, such as Oklahoma and West Virginia. Hot spots are also found in New Mexico and Northern California. One wouldn't think that the San Francisco area would be so impoverished until one remembers that California has the highest cost of living in most states, and San Francisco has the highest cost of living in California. The stress of having to support oneself living paycheck to paycheck can make many turn to drugs as a way to take the edge off. These are most of the causes that have been proposed by both commentators and the government. Some of it is true. Some of it is only half true or even fiction. Doctors, hospitals, pharmaceuticals, law enforcement, legislators, history, lobbying. Many parties are at play, so let's try to figure out what the hell is going on in our country. First, let's look at the drug war. We can go back over a hundred years to the Harrison Narcotics Act of 1914, passed with the intent to restrict the use of opiates to only medical uses. The result was a rise in black markets for opiates. Restrictions on supply do not eliminate demand. But for suppliers, the incentives change when the violence of the state is leveled at them for meeting demand. As a result, competition is highly restricted, giving the vendors that do survive de facto monopolies while at the same time forcing prices up, allowing producers to cut corners in production. During alcohol prohibition, Beginning five years after the Harrison Act, beer producers switched from making beer to making gin, whiskey, and other high-proof drinks. Producers would also make gin with denatured alcohol, alcohol with chemical additives that made it outright poisonous to drink but safe for industrial use. Producers didn't do this out of malevolence, but because that was all that was available. The result is that by 1933, 10,000 people died from poisoning. This effect of suppliers using more potent alternatives that are also impure, more dangerous, is known as the Iron Law of Prohibition. Richard Cohen, who coined the term in 1986, said it best, the harder the enforcement, the harder the drugs. It's no coincidence the drug war started in the 70s to stop marijuana, and by the time of the Reagan administration, they were fighting an epidemic of crack cocaine. However, the inverse of the iron law is also true. In Switzerland, they have solved their opioid crisis by legalizing it and operating government-run clinics where people can inject safer opiates under the supervision of trained nurses. The result has been a rousing success, significantly reducing overdosing in the country as well as crime. It's not gone completely, mind you, and there is strict criteria you have to meet before you're allowed to participate. 
but those that are outside this system are not barked out. After all, heroin is still legal. So here we can see the US government and its restriction on certain commodities it doesn't like ends up making the problems they're trying to solve worse. And we know this. Even most people in favor of the drug war and wanting the Trump administration to crack down on opiates know this. Because they make these exact same arguments against gun control. But the extent to which the government created and exacerbated this crisis is not limited to prohibitions and restrictions. If you recall, medical opioids are legal and able to be given out by prescription, usually for patients recovering from surgery or suffering from persistent or chronic pain. Part of the mainstream narrative on the opioid crisis is that aggressive marketing and campaigns from the pain patients movement of the 90s resulted in doctors being encouraged to prescribe and overprescribe opiate painkillers while altering food and drug administration and American Medical Association guidelines accordingly. Thus, the narrative goes, doctors prescribe them for even minor surgeries and after 60 days on a prescription, an addiction can develop. This narrative is actually mostly true. However, they severely overestimate how often prescription gets people addicted. According to a Harvard study, only 0.6% of people prescribed opiates become addicted. While it's still heartbreaking, the extent to which people are harmed by medicine is far from a crisis. A 2010 study in North Carolina showcased the risk of overdose death among those prescribed opiates by doctors to be roughly 0.022%. Reason.com identified another study from Utah showing that among opioid overdosers, 61% used illegal drugs in the past, 80% had previously been in hospitals for substance abuse, which includes alcohol-related disorders, and 56% have histories with mental disorders. Even so, as explained earlier, Medicare Part D paid for 4.9 million opioid prescriptions. We're left to assume that once addicted, people will either just find help quitting or go to the black market to get their fix. What is omitted is the extent to which the US government created this nightmare scenario. People who become addicted find their options limited. Either go to rehab, an expensive and often ineffective program, the black market has the problem of the iron law of prohibition I mentioned earlier, so such pills are both more expensive and more deadly. The final option is just quitting, but addiction withdrawal, well, it sucks, and many people either relapse or commit suicide. This leaves addicts in a trap of the government's own making. Sometimes it's the government that's directly involved and driving people into the black markets. People do genuinely need opioid prescriptions. They're in pain all the time, and a pill a day is the only way they can feel normal. The trouble is that the government hasn't been idle in trying to solve the opioid crisis. There are several restrictions in place that make it harder for patients to get what they need. If a doctor learns a patient is receiving opiates from somewhere else, they are required to have that supply cut off under penalty of them being prosecuted for being a dealer. The Center for Disease Control also released guidelines for maximum opioid prescriptions, and although compliance is voluntary, failure to comply because, say, you have patients in severe pain can result in your practice being raided by the Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA. The result is is that many doctors simply won't prescribe opiates, leaving pain patients with the option to either travel potentially hundreds of miles for prescriptions, commit suicide, just suffer in silence, or get what they need from the black market. This is actual suffering, endured by God knows how many people who've done nothing wrong. I mean, for the love of God, government... You force these doctors to go through your stupid accreditation system, bowing and scraping, and going into hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt just to get your silly piece of paper that allows doctors to practice. By going after doctors, 
the government is confessing that medical licenses don't work for screening out malicious practicers. I mean, we all know why licenses actually exist, and that's to make healthcare more expensive, but the justification given to us that it's to ensure quality of doctors is being disproven before our eyes. Speaking of suffering, well, it's no coincidence that the areas with the highest rate of opioid addiction and overdose deaths are also places with the highest suicide rates. There is tremendous despair in this country. Economic prospects in many areas are, well, bleak. Large employers are chased out due to U.S.'s high economic restrictions and labor laws, such as minimum wage, restrict employment through price floors. The 2008 financial crash wiped out people's assets, destroying the value of their homes. There are people who had planned out their lives, their retirement, building their dream home, going somewhere, doing whatever, which is now impossible because they lost $200,000 on the value of their home in a month. Something that has not at all recovered in the last 11 years. Make no mistake. The U.S. never recovered from the Great Recession. The unemployment rate improved, the stock market increased, but the actual living standards of Americans, our purchasing power, and finances are in the same precarious situation they were 11 years ago with no end in sight, and nothing to show for it except mountains of debt. I'm not talking about government debt either, though that has more than doubled since 2008. Credit card debt student loan debt, corporate debt. Millions of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, and woefully few of them have more than $1,000 in liquid savings. With job prospects restricted, debt encouraged due to perpetually artificially low interest rates maintained through the Federal Reserve Central Bank and illiquid assets such as real estate, keeping many people financially underwater and being unable to recover after a full decade, well, the despair people have felt, especially in economic destitute areas such as West Virginia, it's not hard to imagine why someone would want something to take the edge off. Things have gotten so bad that for the first time ever, the life expectancy for white males has dropped in the U.S. Enter the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis, a government organization composed of multiple states' governors tasked with researching the crisis and coming up with multiple recommendations for how to solve it. Here's a brief summary of what they come up with. Now, before I go into the very first proposal, I need to point out again that the commission is composed of three state governors, one of whom is the chairman of the organization and they spent much of their time talking to the priesthood from several state governments on what the federal government can do to help. So what is the first proposal? What was the request to the commission by nearly every governor, regardless of party? Give us money! Give us all the money we asked for, and the opioid crisis will be done with! I promise! No specific proposals for how to spend that money, just block grants. Considering the financial straits that states are in, considering the financial straits that states are in as well, of course they'll milk this crisis for every stolen penny they can get their hands on. But if you can't see the glaring conflict of interest in the final report's very first proposal, written mostly by state governors, to give the states more money, then I can't help you. The commission also wants to create a new government program to identify at-risk students in government indoctrination mills. This will definitely stop at-risk students from taking opioids and is definitely not a money laundering scheme to get the federal government to give money to failing schools. Another proposal argues that people aren't indoctrinated enough, despite the fact that government controls mainstream media, they control social media, they control search engines, search algorithms, they control schools, and yet somehow, some way, they don't send enough of their messages towards us. And thus, they propose a vast multimedia propaganda campaign, though it's hilarious they want to address the stigma of opioid use, while at the same time, 
propagandizing and proposing funding even more propagandizing that opioids are the worst thing since Hitler. If you want to get rid of the stigma, stop making it illegal, dumbass! You'll note that legalizing or even decriminalizing heroines or other opiates aren't on here. Other proposals include more propaganda campaigns, advertised as education, getting the government to collect more data on doctors and citizens, new training programs, increasing restrictions and compliance requirements, increasing prison sentences for drug offenses, and more government funding, read, stolen money used to pay for government programs that they promise will work. Now I'm skimming over this, but there are 56 summary recommendations. If I replied to them all, I'd be here all day. But I read them all, so you don't have to. None of them, without a single exception, reduces the size, power, or authority of the state in any way. All of the recommendations are either neutral or more authoritarian. This window into the mindset of our ruling class shows that they don't understand a thing. They think that your autonomy and your independence is a direct threat to society. Either they misunderstand all the incentives, all the root causes, and all the problems, or are willful in the ignorance of it. They either don't know or they don't care. Because their cure, making the government more authoritarian, will make the problem worse. We know this since government authoritarianism has already done this. Rather than being a solution, the government is the driving force behind the opioid crisis. Their laws restrict pain patients' access to medicine, driving them into the black market, where they're more likely to become addicted to deadlier, more potent opioids, thanks to the Iron Law of Prohibition a black market that's already filled by people self-medicating mental health issues like depression or anxiety, catalyzed by the state's continued stranglehold of the economy. And then these same guys have the audacity to dare think they could come up with a solution? The scariest nine words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Government, you've helped enough. At this point, doing nothing would be infinitely better than doing something. But if we wanted to solve these problems, what should we do? First off, alleviating government restrictions on voluntary economic activity, including cutting or even eliminating taxation, would have tremendous benefits for our economy. A better economy means more, better jobs, which will alleviate the despair felt by many addicts today. Legalizing heroin and other opiates will have the same effect it did on Switzerland and Portugal, as competition will rise between legitimate opioid vendors, prices will go down, and quality will rise. As people's job prospects improve, their need for opiates to take the edge off will fall. It goes without saying, but doctors, even drug dealers who provide opiates are not criminals. They're just providing a good or service that people want voluntarily. They aren't aggressing against anyone. So when Donald Trump says things like this, If we catch a drug dealer, death penalty. That's it. Or a dealer or doctor or trafficker or a manufacturer, if you break the law and illegally peddle these deadly poisons, we will find you, we will arrest you, and we will hold you accountable. We should all be alarmed. I think we all know that having the head of every drug dealer who ever lived impaled on a pike on the lawn of the White House won't stop the demand for opiates. But the truth is, it's the priesthood of statism who are the addicts. Climbing social hierarchies triggers the same hormonal response that is triggered by cocaine in the brain. Political power is a drug, one the state and its exalted priesthood are completely addicted to, and they, like any addict, will do whatever it takes to get their next fix. Their interest, first and foremost, is power, and anything that doesn't increase, or at least keep, their level of social authority isn't an option. Like any junkie, they will hurt who they have to hurt, 
steal what they have to steal. Come hell or high water, they will get their next hit. Maybe it's time for a voluntarist intervention. And no, China isn't doing anything wrong making fentanyl. If they were, then equal blame goes to the U.S. Postal Service for distributing it. You fix the opioid problem, you fix the fentanyl problem. It's not that complicated. Questions? Comments? Critique? Do you know anyone who's been affected by the opioid crisis? What do you think would be most effective in combating it? Leave a comment below. Support me on Patreon. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.